So this morning, I want to talk to you about hearing the voice of God. I think it's important as we go through life because there's two different words that we get from God. One is the written word or the logos word. When we read the Bible, that is actually God talking to us. The second thing is the rhema word from God. When God speaks something specifically into us about our own specific situation, no matter what it is, whether you're getting ready to get married, I mean, that's something that you really need to hear from God about. I mean, you need to pray through about it, then you need to pray through about it again. You need to make sure that you did the right thing, because that you're doing the right thing, because... Some things in life and decisions that you make in life affect you for the rest of your life. And if we have God's perspective, that's the best perspective because he's always right. Did we not talk about that last week? He is always right. And so we have this advantage. It's a, it's a real advantage to have God watching out for us and God speaking his word into us. Remember a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the anointing that God has for us, how that we operate, uh, how that the oil uh, in the Old Testament in the, in the tabernacle represented the presence of God and that we're never to let the oil run out. We don't want to run it, let our oil run out in our vehicles, but we especially want to be filled with the spirit and, and have that anointing in us. I mean, it's so crucial. And then last week we talked about uh, how we sometimes think we're right, but uh, it seemed like the right thing to do, but we all know that the only way that we'll be right is when we agree with God. It's not about God agreeing with us, and this is the, this is the, the human element comes into it. It's like, God, you just don't get it. The human element thinks that we know better from God. That's the idol that we tend to worship sometimes. This morning, I want to talk to you about hearing from God. Uh, there, was a, there was a lady that uh, had a near-death experience, and uh, she was in the hospital, and uh, the guardian angel spoke to her while she was in the coma and said, I'm going to give you 30 to 40 more years of your life. So she woke up and she was like, man, I got 30 or 40 more years. And so she went and got, went and got a, a facelift and liposuction and, and a couple things augmented and, and uh, uh, changed the color of her hair. And, uh, and I mean, when she got through, she was just like looking good. And she, and after her last uh, appointment, she walked out of the hospital and and an ambulance speeding through there ran over and killed her. And she got to heaven and, and, and their guardian angel was there and she's like, you said I had 30 or 40 more years. And the guardian angel is, man, that was all on me. I didn't even recognize you. I don't know. <laughs> I, I, was like, I don't know who, I was like, man, who is that woman? Uh, I don't get it. So the question is, is, have you tried to change yourself so much that God doesn't even recognize you? Are we who we were created, who we're supposed to be? Because we'll never have contentment until we are who we are supposed to be from God's perspective instead of, uh, listen, you got to be good with your own skin. There's too many things out here in the world. They want to tell you that you can change your identity. Uh, you are who you are. And God wants to enhance who he created you to be spiritually. And he wants us to be, to, to, to have that. So knowing God's will for ourselves as individuals is one of the greatest gifts that we can give to ourselves because God will never He will never trespass against your will. Somebody might ought to write that down. That's the first time I ever said that that way. God will never trespass against your will. In other words, he will never make you do what you are unwilling to do. He just won't. 
So basically what God's asking us to do here is uh, the most crucial issue we face in hearing God is the motive behind our own hearts. Our motive, and, and God is maybe even more interested in our motives than he is our actual actions of why we do what we do. And that's the reason David said, create a clean. We can't ever hear, I don't think, we can ever hear God's voice as long as we disagree with what he is telling us to do. We'll never have a voice for God's, we'll never have an ear toward God's voice as long as we, our will uh, blocks that passage of his word years ago when I was growing up. And I think it's important for our young people here just kind of getting into high school, getting out of high school, some in, in college years. It's like figuring out what God's will is for your life. It's an important thing because those decisions mold and shape you and we can make good decisions that really bring a blessing to our lives or we can make bad decisions that really sabotage what God's plan is for our lives. And we've all done that as, as, to some extent. We've all sabotaged some stuff. When I was in, in high school, I was praying about God's will. I went to a, a camp, a youth camp, uh, and uh, we got through with church service, and I was feeling real convicted, and the Holy Spirit was just kind of really working on me. And, and so... After church, I walked, it was in, in Utah, and we was up in the mountains. I walked out in the mountains, and I said, Lord, and, and listen to, I, I'm sure you all never tried to manipulate God. Have you? <laughs> but I'm like, Lord, I'll go into the ministry, because going into the ministry was the one thing I did not want to do. But I'm like, Okay. Y'all look really whole way on me. You're like, y'all look so spiritual out there. You're like, I'll go into the ministry if you let a bear walk out into that trail because I know that bear won't eat me because you got a plan for me. And if I see a bear, I know. I know you can do miracles. You just run a bear out there past me and I'll go into the ministry. I'm telling you the truth. I was Thinking serious about it. Do you think a bear came out? No. You know why? God will never be manipulated by us. But I thought it was interesting, hindsight, looking back, I didn't say, okay, Lord, I'll be a carpenter. Okay, Lord, I'll, I'll be a businessman if, if you make a bear. I'll be a... No, the one thing I said was I'll... <laughs> going to uh, ministry, the very thing God wanted me to do, I already knew it, but I didn't know that I knew it, but I knew I didn't want to do it. <laughs> we could write a song like that. <laughs> Don't make me repeat that. Proverbs 4.23 says this. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. Be diligent with the maintenance of your heart. For out of it spring the issues of life. Life comes from the heart. God uses our heart as a spiritual uh, symbol because actually physically, if our heart stops beating, we stop living spiritually. Our, if our spiritual heart is in bad condition, we can't stay alive. Life comes from our heart. And that's the reason we many times refer to life having a heart for God. Because when you have a heart for God, your life is for God. Because life brings the issues of life come from your heart. Hebrews 4.12, it says, for the word of God is living and powerful. This is God's word for us that he has for us. It's living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing <coughs> even to the division of bone and marrow, soul and spirit, and he is a rewarder of those who will, uh, and is a discerner. Uh, I tried to, I tried to uh, quote it and I messed it up. 
joint marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our heart. Whatever the intentions of our heart, God looks past what you're doing and he looks at the intentions, what you intend to receive from your actions and from the things you do. He looks at the intents of your heart. Are you, do you have the right motives in your heart when you ask him what his plan is for your life? Going into a story today in Numbers chapter 22, a guy named Balaam, he is a kind of a prophet. He is a prophet, but uh, there's a little asterisk at the end of that story that title because he's a prophet and he God speaks through him but he also uh he he's a uh he wants to please man uh and it kind of depends on who he's talking to or who he's hanging out with who he wants to please anybody know what a chameleon is a chameleon, you put him, whatever, he's, if, if he was on my shirt, he'd turn the same color as my shirt. So whoever the chameleon hangs out with, that's who he's like. Yeah. I'm just going to stay there for a minute. Let that marinate. Whoever he hangs out with. So uh, Balaam, that's his name, Balaam. A guy named Balak comes to Balaam. Balak is the king of Moab. Balaam, Balak, he, he, he hears that the Israelites are coming through his country and the Israelites are coming to reclaim the land that God intended for them to have, which was the promised land. After they left Egypt, they were coming to take the promised land back. And Balak, the king, hears what's happened to the people that get into the way of God's chosen people. God's not going to have anybody mess up his people. So as they're coming through, Balak wants Balaam to prophesy a curse for God's people. He's like, I just got to, I got to read some of this for you. It's just crazy, crazy, crazy. Balaam saw that it pleased the Lord to bless Israel. He did not resort to divination as at other times. Balaam is like, he, he wanted to please God's people because they was coming through the land and that's who he's hanging out with now. So he didn't resort to divination like he did when he was with the other people. The elders of Moab. Uh, so Balak comes to Balaam. Balaam tells Balak, says, spend the night here, Balaam said, told him, and I'll bring you the answer God gives me. So the Moab Moabites princes stayed with him, and God came to Balaam and asked, who are these men with you? Isn't it funny how God asks a question that he already knows the answer to? Why do you think God would ask Balaam, who are these men with you? Well, the reason we know that he, reason he said that was because we don't think Balaam really knew who these men, who are you hanging out with? That's what he's saying. Who are these men? But God said to Balaam, do not go with them. You must not put a curse on those people because they are blessed. Listen, anytime <laughs> there's a lot of things I don't completely understand about God's blessings, but I do know when God blesses his people, people that come against blessed people always lose. Always lose. <clears throat> when God puts his blessings on somebody, we're not to go against the ones that God blesses. When God has an anointing on people, we don't go against those people. 
We may not understand them, and they may not even be doing the right thing, and we don't understand exactly why God blesses them. That's why he said don't be judging people because the same way that you judge other people will be the same way that God will judge you. In other words, keep your business your business and stop trying to get into other people's business that you don't have any business being in. Yeah. Said, don't go with them. They're blessed people. The next born Balaam got up and, Balaam, and told the princess, said, go back to your country for the Lord has refused to let me go with you. Balaam seems to get off on a good start here. First, number one, he knows enough to seek God for direction. Sometimes a lot of times we don't know what God wants for us because we don't even ask. The second thing, he insists on asking God before he gives them an answer. In other words, he's going to wait for an answer from God. He's going to ask, and then he's going to wait for an answer. And the third thing is, is that he prays to God, the true God of Israel, that he's going, he goes to him in prayer. The answer God gives him is loud and clear. Don't go with them. You would think, you would think that the story would be over now, Right? You'd think it'd be like, oh, no problem. But Balaam had a personal agenda. He really thought of this as an opportunity to get something from man that he could not have got from man had he just been a regular guy out there tending to his sheep cutting the wheat. No, he was a representative of God. So people looked to him as a uh, influencer. Everybody has influence, by the way. Everybody has influence. Some of us have influence with a few people. Some of us have influence with a lot of people. Some ha people have influence with their kids. Some of their kids have influence with their parents. And so our kids can influence us. Influence is something, if we overlook the power of influence, we will overlook something that really needs to be dealt with in our own lives. If we don't see who influences us and who we influence, we are really shortchanging our personal destiny. Influence is important. It's really important to see who you have a voice with and who you don't have a voice with. So Balaam, after God told him, Balaam's like, he said, don't go with him. Is there anybody here that God has told you, don't buddy up with that person? Or God said, don't marry that person. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> or God said, don't take that job. Or God said, don't go into business with that person because that won't turn out well. And that's what he's talking about, about being unequally yoked. It's not just about Christians marrying non-Christians, which is the big deal, but also it's going into business who don't have the same values and the core values, the godly values that you have. He says, says, don't go with them. But how many times have we got into business with people we shouldn't have been in business with? That's yeah. what he's saying. So part of the thing that we understand is, is in God's word, he wants to give you, give you personally a word, but you got to read the Bible to know the Bible. You got to read the Bible to know what God's word is for you. And then you have to be able to discern what, is, what God's saying you through his written word, through the Logos word of God. We can solve a lot of personal problems just through the written word of God. I'm going to wait on everybody here. I can, I can wait. I said we can, paw, we can get through a lot of personal problems if we just know the written word of God. God's will. That's Jesus talking to you. He said don't go with him. In fact, what God was saying is if you curse my people, you're cursing me. Cursing God has gotten really, really, really popular 
in our world today. You cannot watch a movie without somebody cursing God. You can't go, I mean, you can't hardly go anywhere without somebody using God's name in vain. Did you know that when you say the word God, that God is listening? Even when you say, oh my God, he listens to his kids, his children. When you say God, he's paying attention to us. And whenever we edify and we support a lot of these shows and movies, the damn God, like Yellowstone, we think, oh, that's such a good little cowboy movie. They can't, they, they, they are so ignorant that they can't get through one sentence without saying the F-bomb or cussing God. It really, is that something you want your kids watching this? Or is that something? Because the more we get that in us, the more it's going to come out. So God, help us to figure out what curses man and what curses God and not to curse God anymore but to love God and to love man because God has that plan for us. Too many times we're like just sheep wandering around and the wolves come. Let me get back to this. It can really become an obsession for us. Balaam's influenced by God's enemy. And uh, watch this. It says, uh, uh, God even goes a step further and tells Balaam why. He says, because they're blessed. Don't, they're, they're my blessed people. And at that point, Balaam is clear, has clear guidance from the Lord. Hearing from God, we know God always blesses those who bless him. So we should look for the people that God blesses and bless them. Because when we bless who God blesses, we'll get blessed by God. At that point, we need to watch this, how he invites confusion into the scenario about what God wants him to do. God didn't author this confusion. The next morning, Balaam gets up and tells Balak, the princess, to go back to your own country. And now here's, here's his reasoning. For the Lord has refused to let me go with you. He's such a He, he don't, the Lord says, says I can't go. Now, you know, I like you and I'd like to come on with you. I'd like to go with you, but you, God says I can't go. Sound like a, sound like a spoiled little 16 year old wanting to go to a movie. You know I want to go. Let's stop apologizing to people and stop making God look bad as Christians. For the, if, if God calls something sin, let's not apologize because we can't do it. You should have told them that these people are blessed by God and you need to abandon your efforts to curse them. But he wouldn't have anything to do with it. So he sends a greater temptation, more numerous and more distinguished princes come. So the, the king, he's like, hey, this guy's wishy-washy. This guy, he's not convicted. I think I can get him. Because he left room for, Balaam left room for this king and this king's like, oh. I, 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 I got this guy. So what he tempted him with was more affluence and more influence. He said, I'll give you all this, you know, and I'm gonna, this is, this is gonna be good for you, Balaam. And because there was, there was a question mark and a chink in Balaam's armor, that was where the enemy came and tempted him. Did you know that the enemy always tempts the chink in your armor, the, the place where you, you think, you, where, you, where, where you're like, ah, oh, that's where he's gonna go. And generally it's with affluence 
or influence. Either it's with more money or more fame or influence. And, and we look at things and, and if we're not careful, one of those two things, because of the pride that we have inside of us, we want people to look up to us and we want to be recognized. And if, God, if we don't get the recognition that we want from man, then we want to get more money. And when we get more money, we know man's going to recognize us then because man always lifts up people that have more money. And they'll always listen. You think about the people that have the most money in our world today. They're the ones that are on all the social media sites. They're on everything. And everybody, oh, oh, Elon Musk, he talked. So what? But that's what Balaam wanted. Balaam wanted recognition. And if you as a man or a woman of God don't get recognition from man, listen, the most important recognition you can ever get from God, and it may be that God's trying to teach you how to be humble before he can lift you up. Amen. It's the reason he prayed, not my will, not my king, not my kingdom come, but your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You see, the pursuit of his own will caused him to turn a deaf ear to God's will. The pursuit of Balaam's own will caused him to turn a deaf ear to God's will. We know, <clears throat> we know that that Balaam never got the message. He was always riding a fence. And he was always had this chameleon effect and he never did really sell out to God. Jesus made this statement, fasten your seatbelt. This is Jesus talking. He said, I would that you were hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, he said, I'll spit you out of my mouth. This was Jesus talking. Everybody thinks Jesus is like, oh, you know, like, like you remember, anybody remember the hippies? Oh, kumbaya. <laughs> no, he said, I would that you as hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, he said, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. He said, I'm not going to put up with hot or cold. I'm not going to put up with lukewarm. Stop playing games, Balaam. That's what he's saying. You want to hear my voice? That's what I want. I want you to hear my voice. But you got to want to hear my voice before I'm going to waste my words. He said, I would that you're hot or cold. But because you're lukewarm, Balaam, we find out in the New Testament, y'all can do a word search on Balaam if you want uh, and, and get a lot more out of this message if you want to just kind of read up on Balaam. But in, in Revelation in the book of Re Revelation, Jesus is talking to, to the church and he says this, nevertheless, I have a few things against you. You have people there who hold to the teaching of Balaam. This is in the New Testament now. This is not in the old numbers. This is in the New Testament in Revelation, the book of Revelation in chapter 2, verse 14. It said, you have people in the church that hold to the teaching of Balaam who taught Balak, the king, to entice Balaam taught Balak, stay with me, he taught Balak the king to entice the Israelites. He taught Balak how to sin better. Somebody that represented God taught Balaam how to sin better. This is the church said, how to entice the Israelites to sin by eating food sacrificed to idols and by committing sexual immorality. Balaam apparently wound up being Balak's buddy, lifelong buddy. And he took on and actually enticed Balak, the leader of a nation, 
Jude 1, 1, it says they have gone, this again in the New Testament, Jude and Revelation, it says, they have gone the way of Cain and for pay they have rushed headlong into the air of Balaam and perished in the rebellion of Korah. Proverbs 4, 23, I'm gonna quit. It says above all else, everybody say above all else. Above all else, guard your heart. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Proverbs 20, or Psalm 25, 9, it says, He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his ways. One of the greatest gifts that you can give yourself is the gift of humility. Be humble enough to be teachable when God wants to say something to you. Open your heart to the teachability when God speaks something and stop thinking about how you're going to reply while God's trying to talk because you can't listen while you're thinking about what you're going to say after God says something. So Balaam, I got to go. But here's old Balaam. I mean, this is, this is shocking to me. Balaam stays after God and he stays hooked with Balak. And so God does this. He says, he says, go ahead, go with him. He gives Balaam permission to go. After all that, he's going, go on. If that's what you really want, go on, go on. So Balaam's like, I got my way. He goes on down through there and he's riding his little old pet donkey. And the angel gets on the trail there and the donkey won't go past the, 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 the angel of the Lord. And, the, the, and Balaam does what frustrated people do. He goes whooping on his donkey. And we got some cowboys here. We know what it's like when we get frustrated. Generally, what happens in the rodeo world, in the horse training world, if people own a horse, but they don't know how to train the horse, the, tra the, the, the horse doesn't really know what they're doing, but they'll go to whipping on that horse out of their own frustration because they don't know how to train the horse. You wax the donkey, donkey won't go. Wax the donkey again and won't go. You wax him again. Finally, the donkey lays down. He's like, I'm done with this. The donkey's smarter than Balaam. And the donkey talks. God allows the donkey to talk to him. And he said, haven't I been faithful to you all my life? I've done everything that you've asked me to do. I've been a faithful donkey to you. And, and I've never acted like this. And, and, uh, God showed Balaam and opened the eyes of Balaam that there was an angel there. And, and you know Balaam's response. It, it's like all hypocrites. He's like, oh, oh goodness. Oh, oh, I'm so dark. Sorry, little donkey. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm good, I'm good now, I'm good. Oh goodness, so glad, oh. But if, do, if God can talk, Listen to me. If God can talk through a donkey, my goodness, he can talk through us. Yeah. And he can talk to us. Now, God's never spoke out loud to me, but many times it's been louder than out loud. God will never ever, ever disagree with his written word by giving you a spoken word. I have people all the time, because I'm the preacher, I have people all the time coming up to me and they say, well, I heard from God, I gotta get a divorce. I don't like my wife. <laughs> my Bible tells me God hates divorce. Amen. And all the divorced people that got married again said, God hates divorce. And, and I'm, not, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not jumping on the divorce people, but I'm telling you, 
follow through and understand God's heart and get your heart the way God's heart is. And it might just be that if we would act more like God, our marriage might get a little bit better. And we might really just start actually liking our spouse. Maybe it's not God's problem and maybe it's not your spouse's problem. Aren't you glad you come to church? We ain't playing. This ain't no like like Scooby-Doo cartoon time. We need help. But the greatest gift you can give to yourself is humility and uh, just push pause on your personal agenda and see what God's saying to you about your life, it'll be the greatest peace and the greatest gift you could ever give to yourself. Amen. Okay, thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for your blessing. Thank you, Lord, for everybody here. We love you, Jesus. Before we go, we'll have you keep your heads bowed and your eyes closed. If you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, the greatest gift and the first step in, in knowing God is accepting him as your personal Savior. We know that that's the truth because he said this. He said that if we confess our sin, that he would be faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone open, I'll come in and I'll be with him. This morning, if you've never accepted him, maybe if you haven't, you just haven't been living for him, simply by raising your hand, say, preacher, I know I need Jesus in my heart. I know I need to make him the Lord of my life. Slip your hand up high. Preacher, that's me. Thank you, partner. Thank you back in the back. Thank you back in the back. Leave your hands up until we get a Bible in it, please. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high. It's not time to be ashamed anymore. We're not going to go there anymore. We're going to be faithful to God, and we're going to be strong for God. Anybody else before we move on? Preacher, I know I need to get my heart right with God. I need to make it right. Anybody else? Slip your hand up high. Anybody else? Yeah, thank you, Lord. If you raise your hand, look up at me. I'd like to invite you to come down and let me pray with you. Come on, let's hustle down here. This is, a, this is important. Thank you. God bless y'all. I'm so proud of you. This is, this is the day. I know it. I know it. I know it. So proud of y'all. Thank you, buddy. I'm proud of you. So proud of you. Anybody else? Hey, look at here. And this, this is what happens. God gets a hold of us. And it's the day. I think we got one more coming. Yeah. That's perfect. That's all right. I used to be really shy too. But that's okay. Here's what the Bible says. It says, if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus believe in our heart that God has raised you from the dead that will be saved. And I want to help you confess with your mouth, but you got to believe in your hearts. You got to do it. That's the part you got to do yourself, okay? Let's just do this. Just repeat after me. Y'all help us. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Lord, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. I invite you into my heart. I invite you into my life. From this day forward, I give my life to you. Help me to read my Bible, to pray, show up for church, and get baptized. I love you, Jesus. Teach me to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. And I'm proud of y'all. Welcome. <laughs> Go visit these guys. I'm so proud for you. Bless your heart. You might go and visit some of those folks for just a second. Thank you, baby girl. I love you. Bless you. Stand with me, please. Beautiful. Beautiful. The Word. That's the Word. That's what the Word does. That's God. That's God talking. I mean, you say, preacher, I need to... I need to pay 
closer attention to God because I need I need to hear from God more in my life. And, and I really need to know what that written word says better than I know. And I need to know that, that, that spoken word as well. I, I, I need to do a better job of listening because I could be, I need to be more humble. Raise your hand. I just want to pray for you. Raise your other hand. Lord, in Jesus' name, we surrender to you. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to be humble people, help us to be teachable people. Holy Spirit, we know that's what you do, Lord, but we want to get our hearts and our minds and our bodies and our souls. We want to surrender everything to you. In Jesus' name, we speak peace over this congregation. We speak your word over this con congregation. And I speak, speak humility, oh God. And I curse arrogance. I curse pride. I curse division. And I pray, oh God, that your word and your will would happen in each and every one of our lives. And everybody watching online, in Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said, amen. amen. God bless y'all. We love you. Bring somebody with you next week. Got plenty of room in the first service. <laughs>